Okay, welcome guys. This is the mechanical CPR station. Um, and I think mechanical CPR is really interesting. It's a really interesting time for it at the moment. Um, in particular, in the light of the CHEER study, which is going to be done pretty soon. Have any of you heard of the CHEER study? So this is um, a study which is looking at a combination of mechanical CPR for out of hospital cardiac arrests and bringing them in, putting them on VA ECMO and cooling them and seeing if that improves outcomes. And this is off the back of some pretty amazing um, cases they've had down at the Alfred in Melbourne where they've had some incredible saves after prolonged CPR um, and long downtimes. Um, mechanical CPR is not a new thing, it's been around for a long time and a few places have been using it um, and it's, it's taken off in North America and it's particularly used in rural and remote settings where you really can't have someone tied up doing CPR the whole time. There are two main devices on the market at the moment. This is the Zoll Autopulse. There's also the, um, the Lucas device, which is a piston um, device, which is an AP type one. There are advantages and disadvantages of both, I guess. Um, the Lucas um, is a bit lighter, lighter to carry. The retrieval guys like it for that reason. And it's um, radiolucent, so you can put it on a cath lab table, still do x-rays right through it. Um, the Zoll's slightly heavier. It's still not that heavy if you feel it. And but it's, it is slightly heavier than the Lucas, um, and it's radio opaque, so if you're doing shoot-throughs on the cath lab table, you have to use an oblique view to do it, but you can still definitely do that. Um, I think an advantage of this device is it's a compression device rather than a um, piston device. It squeezes the whole um, thoracic cavity. It tailor-makes this um, compression. It measures the thoracic cavity and the weight of the patient and then does a 20% compression of the, um, of the thoracic cavity to squeeze the blood through. And you still get the recoil and filling um, effects. Um, and because of that, the pounds per square inch are a lot less in any one place. And you'll feel you can put your hand underneath it while it's squeezing. It's only about three pounds per square inch in any one spot. Whereas the piston devices are more like about 25 pounds per square inch. And that's why you get more uh, myocardial injuries and more fractured ribs and so on with those kind of devices. Um, in terms of proof that it works, well, when you see it on, you'll see that it does work. You just intuitively, you know, that's better than a lot of the CPR that you see on the wards and so on. Um, there, are, there are studies which show that the surrogate endpoints are pretty good. Things like the saturations, the systolic and diastolic blood pressure, entail CO2, all of those things are improved with it. So that's reassuring. Um, in terms of hard data to support neurological outcomes and uh, mortality, that's a bit lacking still. So there are two big trials. There's the CERC trial, which was with the Autopulse, and then there was the LINK trial, which was the Lucas device that was out last year. Both of them didn't show mortality benefits for um, the mechanical CPR, but in both of the studies, the normal CPR that was going on was good standard and they'd made sure that that was really high quality good CPR which is probably not what happens on every day in the, in the ward um, so I don't think we were really comparing like with like necessarily um, but and as I say there are other trials ongoing at the moment so what we're going to do now is uh, Mike from Zoll is going to take you through the equipment. He's going to show you um, how to put it on, show you around the machine, how to switch it on. He'll also show you the defib um, and then you'll get to have a play and look at the different bits of equipment and, and see how it works so that if, um, hopefully you'd be confident to um, deploy it if you had to in your hospital. Okay, so with Autopulse there are a couple of limitations. Uh, one contraindication is that it's for medical resuscitation only, so non-trauma patients, adults only, no kids under the age of 18. Uh, and in terms of weight restrictions, you're limited to um, a maximum of 300 pounds or about 136, 137 kilograms, somewhere around there. Okay. Um, so there are three components, basically. The, there's the board itself, there's the circumferential life band or the load distributing band, uh, and then there's the battery component at the back. So it takes a lithium-ion battery, uh, quite a large battery like that, and that goes in over there. So the process you follow is basically an under with a board, board, the board goes under the patient, the band goes over the patient's chest, and you switch it on and get it going. You've got to align the patient up properly on the board, of course, because you, 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 do, you don't want it to deliver any, any bad compression. So you just follow your guidelines uh, on the centre of the board. There's the yellow line here. That, that goes underneath the patient's armpits. And then the yellow line on the, on the life band over here is aligned up to that. So once you've got everything aligned up, you'll deliver good compressions. So the big advantage of this is you, you're delivering good quality uh, chest compressions that are uninterrupted. So it's going to free you up uh, and give you an extra set of, set of hands to, to deal with other sort of stuff. 
Uh, and then thereafter, so we're going to go through the deployment and then we're going to hook up the, the X-Series defibrillator as well and we'll run through a couple of CPR and shock scenarios as well. Okay, so when we talk about the deployment, we, we use a, we tend to use a, a three-person deployment, so it takes, you're going to take two people to, one under each arm to lift the patient into a semi foundless position and then a third person to grab the, 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 the auto pulse, switch it on and stick it under the patient's back. Okay, so I'll get my two, uh, my two gorgeous assistants to uh, give us a hand over here. So we've got manual CPR going. We need to prepare our auto pulse, get it the right way around, and switch it on. So we've got good battery power going. So whenever we're ready, we'll do the three-person deployment. So yep. are you guys ready? Yep. So one, two, three, lift. Step it under the patient's butt, get the band out of the way, lay the patient down. And we want to align the patient up, remember, remembering our yellow line on the board in line with the patient's armpit. So the board goes, up, board goes under, band goes over. You can stop. So I line up our yellow lines, reset our band. This ye yellow bar should, should go on the lower half of the sternum where you'd normally do chest compressions. Check the side stra stra straps are perpendicular to the board and not twisted, okay? Set that down, push start. It sizes up the patient's chest and compression start. Okay. So there are two, two operating modes. There's 30 to 2 for your patients that are non intubated. So it's going to do 30 compressions and then it will pause momentarily for you, for you to deliver your two ventilations. Yeah? So there's our prompt for ventilations right there. Okay. So once you've got a definitive airway in place, like an ET tube or an LMA or something, you can switch it into continuous mode. So now it's in continuous mode, it's just going to do co compressions throughout, but every so often you'll hear a beep like that to, to prompt you to deliver your ventilation. So you just sort of time your ventilation with the upstroke of the device, otherwise you'd have the two competing with each other, your ventilation and your downstroke of the device. Okay. Easy to follow, yeah? Quite simple. Okay. So once we've got the defib hooked up, you're going to be using this defibrillator here. It's called the X-Series. So the green button on top is your on-off switch, right? And then down at the bottom here are your defibrillation buttons. So it's really easy to use. It's a one, two, three system. So straight away, you're going to find that the patient's in a... VFib, hopefully, somewhere along the line. Okay, so you'll find the patient at VFib. So, step one is to hit your energy select button to bring, bring up your DFib dashboard basically there. So, you can see it's going to default to 200 joules, which is guidelines. Two is to start it, uh, charge it up. And three is to deliver the shock. One, two, three. So during the shock scenario, while auto pulse is going, you would first prepare your defib, charge it up to 200 joules, stop auto pulse, confirm your rhythm that it's shockable, stand clear, deliver your shock, and resume auto auto pulse uh, compressions. Okay. So we'll, we'll give that a try. We'll continue auto pulse. Are you guys still involved? <laughs> okay. So we can see that that's a shockable rhythm still. So we'll select our energy level, charge it up, and see that's a shockable rhythm. So we'll stop, confirm, stand clear, shock, resume auto pulse. Do you guys want to come and have a closer look? Jules, okay. Stop. Confirm. Stand clear. Shock. 
recommends uh, auto pulse compressions. So hit start. There we go. 